We're going to look at an experiment today that, a demonstration, that kind of reflects the fact that when we teach a high school chemistry course, we never get to organic chemistry. So a number of friends and I over the years have talked about when you're teaching something, if you can use organic examples, do it. If you're teaching ChemCom or a biochemistry class, this works very nicely for you. I want to go over to the board. I have sort of a generic amino acid here, uh, an alpha amino acid, if you will. An amine group at one end, carboxylic acid group at the other. If it's appropriate to your class, you can talk about the fact that the amino function of one molecule can undergo a condensation reaction with the carboxylate or the carboxylic group at the other end of another molecule that forms a peptide linkage. You get a bunch of those peptides joining, you get a polypeptide, and eventually you get to a protein. When I was taking organic chemistry, I saw all these sort of generic reactions with R's in them. I finally figured out that R stands for the rest of the molecule. There's this part, and there's this part, and then there's that other stuff in the middle. This is to represent a protein, a long sequence of uh, chains of these joined together end to end to end to end endlessly. If I have just the carboxylic acid at one end and the amino, the amino group at the other end, that's referred to as the isoelectric point, and we'll come back to that. A protein is not particularly soluble in water, although I have an example of one here that is soluble up to an extent. So if we go back to the table, this is a solution, somewhat cloudy, one gram of casein, the primary protein in, uh, in milk, in 250 milliliters with a little bit of excess uh, sodium hydroxide added. And I'm going to put a carefully measured amount. I have calibrations on my goggles. So you might need to use a graduated cylinder. We'll put some of that in there. At this point, remember I said it's slightly basic, so if we go back to the board, what I really have is this. The presence of excess hydroxide makes this end ionic. That improves the solubility in water. What I'm going to be doing is neutralizing that excess hydroxide, which is going to bring me back to the isoelectric point. The problem with that is, it's not soluble in water. This end might be suitable for, for water. This end will uh, react with water. But this stuff in the middle is so big that what you'll see is the solution gets much more cloudy than it is. So what I'll do is keep adding acid, bring it over here, and we'll see it clear up again. We'll go back and forth a couple of times. So. When, uh, when I do demonstrations involving a magnetic stir in my classroom, the best part of the demonstration, as far as the students are concerned, is right there. That is so cool! How does it do that? Wow! Can it go faster? Wow! And of course, my answer is uh, magic, but that's my answer to everything. So I've got the casein solution, slightly alkaline. I've got a three molar hydrochloric acid solution. Use a transfer pipette. Let's see what happens. You're looking for cloudiness here. And I want to make sure that's stirring pretty rapidly. The problem with this, or the thing you have to be careful with, is that when I get to that isoelectric point, when it gets cloudy, I have to keep going. 
I can't stop there because if I leave it at the isoelectric point for more than about 20 seconds, I'll never get it back in solution. So here we go. Getting towards it. Getting towards it. There's almost the isoelectric point. I keep going and it clears back up. So now if you look at the board, I'm over at the left hand end of that equation now. I've protonated the amino group at the end. And I've got back to a pretty clear solution. Let's go back the other way. In this case, I have three molar sodium hydroxide. So now we're starting at the left and we're going back that way. As I add, I get toward the isoelectric point. Starting to get pretty murky. Don't want to leave it there. Keep going. Keep going. And now I'm back to where I started. The question is, is that isoelectric point, is this thing at pH 7? And the answer is, in general, no. Um, what I'm going to try to do is add bromthymol blue to this and see if we can get an idea. The Color change range is from 6 to 7.6, .6, yellow to blue if you're going from acid to base, blue to yellow if you're going from base to acid. So again, calibrated goggles, carefully measured amount. Blue, base. Hydrochloric acid. What we're looking for now is if we can tell whether the cloudiness comes right in between at green or whether it's a little bit before green, the thing's still blue, a little bit after, is it getting pretty yellow? Remember, I can't stop at the isoelectric point, so this is, I'd say, quick and dirty at best, but we'll see what we can do. Oh, it's not cloudy yet. Now it's cloudy. And now it's clear. Cloudiness came when I was on the acid side of the range, which means I was closer to 6 than I was to 7.6. How much closer? I have no idea. But at least I'm able to see that the isoelectric point is, in fact, not at pH 7. Let's go back the other way. Come out, come out wherever you are. Okay, there's about my isoelectric point, and clearly it's yellow. I don't know if the camera's picking it up, but I'm seeing green. And now I'm getting on to blue. I don't know if you noticed, but just at the end there, I had some serious thickness. I had left it there long enough that it was starting to... Uh, get ready to precipitate. Anyhow, there is an application of amphotericism. There is an, amp uh, an application of protein uh, chemistry, an organic application of acid-base chemistry. A good demonstration is one that you can use where you need it, and, that, and that's attractive. And I think this is one that qualifies in those, all those regards.